I welcome uh, everybody on the screen and here um, at the panel uh, for joining our eighth Frankfurt Conference on Financial Market Policy. Um, this is an event that has been stretched out over several weeks this year due to the pandemic. Um, the title over all the different panels that we had over the past couple of weeks are um, uh, the coronavirus, what are the lessons for finance? And today we will talk about the recovery program, the European recovery program, which happens individually in countries, but also more broadly uh, as a big effort of the uh, European Union. And um, I'm very grateful for the three panelists with, who joined with me today to discuss and to reflect upon these policy um, decisions and the, the big steps that each country wants to make forward. And these um, three panelists come from three countries which have historically been working a lot together on all these issues that relate to, let's say, financial stability, financial market development and so forth. Um, it, is, uh, it is Britain, it is Germany, it is France, so to speak in, in alphabetical order in, in this case. And, uh, and our, our three speakers, which I will uh, introduce in a, in a second on the panel, um, are Mark Bowman, Jörg Cookies, and Emmanuel Moulin. They, have, uh, they are all, also all three architects of the recovery programs in their countries. So it is a very unique opportunity today to have these um, experts and also the politically responsible persons for much of what we see and discuss today on the table and let them jointly uh, talk and discuss um, about particular challenges and uh, which are ahead of us, but also which type of responses uh, we could uh, or they could invent and um, how, how we can basically also in a certain sense compare um, these uh, programs among, um, among each other. The three persons, so I want to introduce them quickly. Mark Bowman um, is a Director General um, uh, and particularly responsible for international and, and European Union affairs at His Majesty's Treasury in London. And he has been working for many years in the, in the Treasury and had several uh, important tasks in this, in this institution um, and has always been somehow connected to uh, strategic and financial issues, which now uh, is basically also the main um, area of our, of our discussion today. Um, yeah, cookies. Of course, doesn't need really an introduction here in, in, in a panel that's broadcasted from Frankfurt in Germany, State Secretary for Financial Market and European Policy at the Federal Ministry of Finance in Berlin. He had a, a career which was, was for the very first part academic, for the second part in, the, in, in, in banking at Goldman and Sachs, and, and, and later then uh, at the finance ministry in, in Berlin. So he has a very broad, he has very different perspectives. Um, and his PhD that I should mention is from the University of Chicago. Um, so he also brings this, I would say, international dimension to his work. Uh, and Emmanuel Moulin, who is director general at the French treasury, he took over this post from Odile uh, basso Renault uh, just recently. Um, and he has been an advi economic advisor to President Sarkozy, but he has also been out in business as a CEO of Euro Tunnel Group and have held other positions, um, for, uh, for instance, Deputy Chief, Chief of Staff for Macroeconomic Policy and Finance um, uh, at, the, at the Ministry of Economy, Finance and Industry in, in Paris. So all bring also a, a, a big background uh, related to finance with them. And I think that is also what is important for us um, as a research center safe. I should mention all three are also member of our policy advisory council that helps us to address the right questions 
in um, uh, in, in, in in research because that is what the uh, institute, which is a newly founded Leibniz Institute, uh, does. Uh, we also get involved in in policy advisory work um, and also often building on input and ideas that uh, that develop from our meetings with the policy advisory council. So today, in a way, is a is a, almost like a discussion in this in this group on the current issues that uh, uh, emanate from the dealing of countries and uh, and the European Union with the big challenge that the coronavirus um, uh, puts on all of us. So I want to give a very very quick uh, uh, first introduction in, in, in what it what what we are facing. Uh, I, I, have, I entitled the slide GDP growth rate negative for long. So there are various scenarios. What are the consequences of the coronavirus? And these are just OECD numbers as an example, more an example as the, as the only type of fact that, that I could present. It just shows that there is a significant uh, and lasting loss expectation in terms of GDP growth. And uh, this varies a lot um, across countries. And that, that table basically, or this graph, gives you several indications. Some countries are winners, some countries are losers in this uh, two-year picture, two-year forecast that you see from the OECD. Um, the variations across countries is huge, which produces problems in itself. Uh, the fact that we have so many countries with lasting negative GDP projections means that it is not simply a liquidity thing that has to be solved. It's not simply a short-term interruption as we all thought it would be, like a V-shaped recovery was the word of the day a few months ago. Um, and uh, that means that we need some treatment and that's what we will speak about today. The other thing that you see also uh, or can can learn from the graph is there is a lot of uncertainty what's really going on. That estimate that you see on this graph is in a way a point estimate, a particular number, but the reality is that it's a, it's a big variation there and even in our estimates and uh, the world can be very different over these next two years than the one that you see here. And we have to prepare for that as well. So the uncertainty issue is also a big challenge. You have national programs that have uh, different structures and I don't go into this detail of this graph. I just want to want to say each country has responded already and come up with plans, uh, emergency plans, mostly on the liquidity side, helping companies and so forth going forward. So this has been done and can be compared, but it is uh, only partly what we are looking at today because we look at the longer longer term picture. And last slide is on this uh, next generation uh, EU program that has been set up 750 billion heavy uh, with all sorts of ideas where the money should be spent. And I think that's mostly what part of our discussion today will be on. So we have three speakers and uh, they will both, all, all three give a uh, basically a, sh a short um, statement, impulse you may call it, on um, different aspects of the same issue, namely what is what are, what's in for policy in this situation. And then we take it from there in, in a discussion at the panel, on the panel, and also with the audience. So I want to um, ask the audience to use the uh, question function, the Q&A function on, uh, on the screen to put up questions. And those who read the questions could also vote them up. So the more votes a question gets, the higher it gets in the in the list, and it will be taken up then um, by me later on uh, during uh, the course of the of the of the panel. So that is uh, all I have to say as an introduction, and I now hand over to um, to your cookies, um, and I, I, I stop my um, screen sharing. And uh, Jörg, the floor is 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 yours. Yes, so, so thank you. And uh, of course, it's uh, very uh, good that uh, we can speak up about all of the European issues and all of the uh, national implementations of what we're doing um, and um, and to see um, what we can uh, um, extract as policy 
um, recommendations out of it. I think um, we are, um, of course, uh, very, uh, very glad that uh, Europe um, has had a very different type of response to this crisis than to the 08 09 crisis. I think one of the key characteristics uh, starting in uh, February, late February, early March is that uh, there has been a forceful fiscal response at the member state level from all member states from the beginning of the crisis. Um, I think uh, um, you know, all of the large member states uh, pretty much in sync um, announced uh, big programs of fiscal response um, early on in the crisis. So I think that was a very um, welcome um, 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 symmetric response uh, that uh, that uh, immediately stabilized the situation um, um, at the beginning. Um, you know, Germany was, of course, no exception to that uh, to that rule. Um, with our bazooka program, we um, we launched a quite forceful response uh, composed of um, explicit spending, guarantee programs, and um, direct support to um, employees and companies through short labor scheme and other. Um, instruments that uh, immediately pro um, provided relief. So in that sense, I think uh, we uh, we had a very good and strong initial response um, in the course of March, and of course um, initiated the discussion um, in the course of March already on um, what a European response could look like. Um, and then um, came three very um, eventful, um, intense, um, and productive nights in um, early April. That led to the Eurogroup um, um, statements and uh, the Eurogroup decision um, on a uh, 540 billion program um, of lending um, through, uh, on the one side, the, um, the ESM, on the other side, the EIB, and the SURE program by the Commission. So in that sense, uh, providing on the one side for governments um, to um, get access to ESM funds in a very easy way to uh, fund investments into healthcare systems, um, the EIB being active um, with a uh, member state guaranteed extra program to reinforce their ability to provide guarantee programs. Um, and then, um, of course, the, um, the um, SURE program to uh, finance uh, qualification and short-term labor and employment uh, regimes across the EU. So I think that, uh, that was already a very good initial signal that uh, Europe is acting um, quickly, forcefully, and um, in a united way. Um, we then had very intensive discussions on one element of the Eurogroup statement, which was postulated in, in the statement as a goal, but not as a um, definitive um, result yet. Um, but the definitive result is now a uh, next generation EU. Um, so that was already sort of in an, um, in an uh, early stage um, incorporated as a goal in the, um, in the Eurogroup statement of the 9th of April. And then um, the discussions, of course, between member states um, started pretty quickly and uh, between Germany and France uh, spe specifically um, started um, very intensively and led to the um, joint announcement between uh, President Macron and uh, Chancellor Merkel on the um, what is now the um, the um, the next generation EU and the recovery and resilience facility, which then took another several nights to negotiate. Um, and I think that uh, that is now the the key question since July is uh, is the implementation. Um, as the EU presidency, we immediately started with the implementation when the decision was made um, and started drafting the, um, the required um, legislation. On the one side, um, for us, um, essential is, of course, the own resources decision, um, and on the other side, all of the legislation to implement the recovery and resilience facility. Um, from a council level, we're done um, with both of them um, um, effectively, although, um, um, of course, as you all know, um, the question of rule of law is preventing the formal implementation at the moment. Um, but from a pure technical standpoint, um, um, we are we are very very far in the in the debate on the own resources decision. Um, you know that's uh, that's uh, that's uh, effectively ready to um, to implement um, on the MFF. Um, it's ready to implement on the 20, 2021 budget um, that will that will um, will design the spending programs of the MFF for next year is also done and agreed. Um, 
The one area that where we're still negotiating um, in trilogue with the parliament is on the recovery and resilience facility. Um, there's some differences um, um, between the EP and uh, the council on that one, uh, but um, you know, relatively speaking, um, if you compare the um, the um, um, extent of, um, of um, difficulties or, um, or negotiation with the rule of law questions, it's more, um, it's, uh, it's issues that will certainly be resolved. There's questions on, you know, what is the percentage going into green? There's a question on how much um, is paid upfront um, relative to um, um, and before handing in and getting approval for the national recovery plans. Um, so those are all important issues. There's some, um, um, the EP wants more commitment on horizontal spending um, floors than the council is willing to, um, to um, concede. Um, so all those are, are important issues, but um, I think the overarching issue, of course, as we all know, is the rule of law question. Hopefully we'll get some uh, clarity on that and resolution at the, at the head of state and government um, level um, in the next few days. Um, but uh, you know, I can't uh, say much more than speculation. And of course, the same goes uh, for the big question that uh, that we're discussing with the UK on uh, Brexit. Um, so you know, I, I think uh, the, the both sides are still negotiating. We all know there's um, difficult issues to resolve, uh, but um, you know, I can't comment on any kind of um, um, further details. Uh, just to express my hope that a good solution will be found. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you, Jörg. That um, gave a wonderful starting point. So we now know all these, these programs um, and also that there are a, a number of, of open ends, I would say. I mean, more on the, on the legal, on the political side that, you, that may be resolved, but where probably if the resolution cannot, found, cannot be found quickly, an alternative route would also be available so that in the end uh, the the program will go through right so that is i think the the, the main message we shouldn't reckon with the failure of the program uh, as it stands and it would be a a, a a moment to basically go into the details if i may ask one question back that is you said well there are little things that need to be negotiated for instance the percentages, uh, so the, the, the type of allocational uh, conditions that are put up in the program, how, how much is going to green or digital. Could you expand a little bit on that? Because I think this is very important for the later, let's say, um, the type of expectations we can, we can hold um, in view of this program. Yep. And so breaking news, um, Bloomberg just reported three minutes ago that uh, Hungary and Poland have uh, agreed on a compromise. I ah, wow. That, uh, oh, that was, uh, thank you for letting us know. It's Bloomberg, so we, we others know it also, but it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, very um, good to know. It's breaking news, but you know uh, we all know how many times uh, news broke and turned out not to be um, not to be true. So uh, let's wait. Let's wait for confirmation. Um, on the horizontal issues, I think I mean the, the key point for council is that we have two very fundamentally important strategic horizontal issues with clear spending um, uh, guidelines, and that is um, that is the green deal and uh, the digitization topic. Um, and uh, the rest is um, um, up to the decisions by the member states in the context of the European semester and the country specific recommendations. Um, and so this mixture of horizontal and vertical issues is something that's extremely important for the council. Um, and so, um, so basically the idea being that yes, a vast majority of the spending um, is sort of pre-committed to those two areas, 50-ish um, um, percent, but on top of that, there is the element of country specific um, combinations of reform packages um, accompanying the country specific recommendations that are then implemented via spending programs. So that is key and was a core element of the decision making process at, uh, at the head of state and government level. Um, and now, what the um, EP is proposing is to add four additional horizontal topics such as youth and um, health and others to basically um, basically pre-commit the member states um, how their mixture of uh, spending uh, would have to be. Um, and for for the um, council, that is too prescriptive because um, um, you know by definition the country specific recommendations are country specific. Um, so the um, the 
mixture of the spending will necessarily vary by member state. And we find therefore too many individual floors um, of uh, minimum amounts being spent on individual policies is too restrictive um, for the general goal of also giving the um, semester process and the country specific recommendations process a, a very central role in the approval of all of the national recovery programs. I understand properly the countries, each country individually has to come up with a plan by next June and which would basically have to meet those conditions which have been prescribed plus expand of what, what else they are going to do. That Exactly. And if the, 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 our point is if you already basically give the mixture of how the spending areas um, have to be horizontally, um, then of course that leaves very little room to address um, country specific um, needs for reform. So in that sense, I think uh, we, we need the, 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 and that's precisely why the council gave this focus on the two areas of, um, of, um, of, um, of spending um, floors, um, namely environment and digital. Um, that was then made more concrete during the whole um, negotiation about the MFF and the big picture uh, with the parliament. But now, of course, in the specific RRF regulation, these points are brought up again. So okay. I'm sure so, we'll find a solution though. Yeah, 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 yeah I think so. And, and just last, last thing, these additional horizontal suggestions, they would come on top of the 58% or they would be part of that 58%? No, they would come on top. On top, so that then the room for these country specific elements would be diminished. That's basically the yes, uh, yeah. and they would all have to be implemented in the context of those spending areas. And uh, if yeah. someone has yeah. completely different spending areas, then it would be hard to integrate them. So that's yeah. a, that's the general um, debate now between uh, yeah. part of the council at the moment. Okay, okay, so thank you very much for this first. Uh, um, uh, point. I, I am, if there's anybody on the panel who wants to ask a question to you, please show me. I, I can see everybody <laughs> well. Show me by raising your hand. Otherwise, I would move on to Mark Bowman um, and uh, ask him to start with a with an with a short statement that he wishes to make. So, in our plan, we said how to achieve recovery goals efficiently, and with this, um, we thought to to indicate. Um, of course, uh, the UK is now outside um, the European Union, so has its own plan and not uh, is not part of the planning process uh, in the in the European Union. And I, I don't ask you to 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 comment on that process, but UK faces the exact same problems and maybe even more serious than in some other countries. In the original table that I showed on my first slide, where you saw the different. Uh, projections, uh, two-year projections for, for growth, UK was one of the uh, heavily, the most heavily hit countries in, in the world. And uh, it, this may or may not be true, but the um, necessity for a recovery plan certainly is also there. And I thought in this, uh, in this team of three, we have uh, basically Germany and France who, who work together closely anyway on this recovery. And uh, you, Mark, represent, so to speak, the outside view, and maybe you have other policy um, paths and, and, and solutions and suggestions that work work better. When I thought about your, um, uh, talking to you, I thought, well, the UK is now in, in some sense freer to, to, to select from, uh, uh, from, from, from different options because it doesn't have to consider what other um, countries would say, just the discussion that you have made up about how many conditionalities are desired or not desired by certain countries. This is just one country can optimize its response. And so it would be very interesting to hear how you would answer the question, how to achieve recovery goals efficiently. Great, thank you. Thank you, um, thank you very much for, for, for that. And um, a great pleasure to um, be here today on this, on the, on this panel. Um, I mean, I, I will. I will talk about the UK economy. I will talk about some of the challenges we face, the, the kind of policy interventions we've made, and um, uh, I guess really mainly try to kind of frame my comments in terms of the challenges as we as we look forward to the recovery phase. And um, 
I guess my my main comment is simply about uncertainty and the kind of difficulty of um, uh, setting out clear plans given the, the the significant uncertainty that we we continue to to face. Um, I'm I'm deliberately not going to talk about um, Brexit. Um, I mean, obviously, um, and you all mentioned this. Obviously, we're at a very political stage of the negotiations. Um, our Prime Minister meeting the President of the Commission in Brussels this evening. I don't think it's useful to um, speculate on, on on what might happen. And I think the um, issues and sticking points in the negotiation are, are fairly well, well known to to everyone. I, I will, you know, echo your comment that um, let's hope that we can get a, a satisfactory. Um, uh, solution and a good, a good, a good solution. Um, in terms of in terms of the UK, um, you know, obviously, like everyone else, we faced an unprecedented crisis. Um, our independent office of budget responsibility published its forecast, updated forecasts at the end of um, uh, November, and it was, um, uh, you know, quite a sobering event to um, to read there. To read their documents, to to see their forecast, they're, they're expecting that GDP in the UK this year will fall by around 11%. Um, clearly, the the UK economy was 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 hit very hard by the initial lockdown in the spring. Um, GDP was down by um, around 20%. Um, we saw a degree of recovery over over the summer as restrictions um, uh, eased and um, uh, the the economy. Um, uh, started working again, and I think by by September the level of GDP was about eight percent below what it had been in in February. Um, but since then, of course, we've had you know like others, we've had a resurgence of the of the of, of the virus, and uh, output is likely to have fallen again. Um, although you know important important to note that yes, we. Um, like other countries, we've imposed new restrictions. We've just come out of a national lockdown into a system of regional regional tiers. Um, uh, we think that, or we, we are sure that the impact on the economy of the current restrictions is much less than it was in the in the spring, partly because the um, uh, restrictions are less severe, um, but also uh, because of the degree to which the economy and, and economic actors have adapted to the to the situation, and you know, for example, moving activities um, online, restaurants, um, uh, moving into takeaway business, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, looking forward, I mean, the, the, you know, the, the, to, to, to highlight the uncertainty, um, as I said, our, our office for budget responsibility forecasts uh, GDP down by about 11 percent this year, and then a recovery um, over the course of the next few years. Um, one of the things they did to illustrate the uncertainty was to set out various scenarios, um, and um, their, their central scenario has GDP reaching its pre-crisis levels by the end of 2022, um, but they have a downside scenario where that doesn't happen until the end of 2024, and an upside scenario where that happens a year earlier, so by the end of end of next year. And I think that's that's useful just to kind of highlight that the, the, the massive uncertainty um, uh, we we face in terms of economic policy making. Um, I guess I should say something about the relative performance of the, of the UK. You, you you showed a slide at the beginning, and you um, uh, made the point that it appears that the UK has been one of the hardest hit um, uh, countries. Um, I think it's you know it's very interesting to um, uh, to think about the potential reasons for that, um, and I think the explanation lies in a combination of the you know the different experience with the. The virus, the extent to which we were hit by the virus, obviously the um, the level of restrictions that we had to impose. Also, interesting questions around the structure of the economy. The UK being a services-based economy, um, quite a high proportion of what we what we now call social consumption in 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 GDP activities that have been hit by um, restrictions, um, and also. Um, I think some element of um, uh, measurement issues, um, which which may explain some of the, um, the divergent economic performance, and that's that's principally around how um, uh, public uh, sector activity is 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 measured um, in 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 our GDP, and um, I, I won't go into all the all of the all of the details about that, but, but clearly, you know. Um, 
uh, economic statistics and you know the, the different different measurement um, uh, methodologies have a have, have a have a big impact when, when you get very large swings in the in the in the in the figures. Um, Turning to the um, to the fiscal side, I mean, you know, if you look at the the the, the fiscal side of the equation, uh, potentially the numbers are even more dramatic, with a, um, a deficit projected to be around 20% um, uh, this year, and clearly that reflects the um, the very significant um, interventions that the government has made to support the economy. Um, the the centerpiece of that being the um, uh, employment support, the furlough scheme that we have um, uh, operated, that has paid directly paid the wages of um, uh, nine million nine million people. Um, clearly, also we've had support for you know we've, we've had a, a, a range of measures. You know, we've we've all. Um, implemented slightly different measures um, uh, given the structures of our economies and our different administrative systems but we've we've had support for um, those employed support for those unemployed we've had loan schemes for for, for businesses tax deferral um, schemes and um, yes very very dramatic um, intervention into the um, uh, economy in terms of you know thinking forward about the the, the recovery phase and the the challenge we face, um, like others, of course, the the objective of government policy has been to prevent long term scarring on the um, economy, um, to see this as a, a temporary crisis and to protect economic activity so that businesses can can bounce back when restrictions um, are um, lifted. Um, but it has obviously been very difficult to design that, given um, uncertainty about how long the virus will will last for, um, and uncertainty about what the economy will look like in the future. So, if you put that more simply, clearly governments want to support and protect businesses that will be viable in the future. Um, but how do you determine which businesses will be viable in the future? The changing structures of the um, economy, and how do you get the balance right between supporting jobs, supporting businesses, um, against um, allowing to happen a necessary reallocation of resources um, within the, the economy. That, that in, in my mind, kind of sums up the overwhelming policy challenge that we, um, we all face. Um, now, if we, if we look forward, I think it's, it's, it's fair to say that, you know, compared with a couple of months ago, um, there is now a, a degree of optimism given developments with vaccinations and um, uh, the UK started its vaccination programme um, uh, yesterday. Um, um, so I think um, uh, we can begin to see um, a, a potential course out of this crisis. That's not to underestimate the, the challenges here in terms of deployment of vaccines, manufacturing, and um, not to underestimate the, the timelines will, that will be involved. Um, but you can you can begin to see a course out of this crisis, um, uh, and um, and I'm going to kind of return to to, to to normality at some point over the course of the next year. In terms of how the economy will react to that, that's in, incredibly difficult for all the reasons I've said. It's incredibly difficult to um, uh, project to what extent will there be a kind of strong back, bounce back in economic activity due to pent up demand in the economy, to what extent will high levels of unemployment, dislocation and high levels of debt be a, um, a drag on, on, on the recovery. Um, but I think all, all of us will face very similar challenges. We will, we will emerge from um, this crisis with higher levels of unemployment, higher levels of corporate debt, and higher um, levels of, of public debt. And the, 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 the economic issue that we are going to have to face in the coming months is um, the calibration of how we withdraw support from the economy, the pace at which we withdraw support for the economy um, in order not to endanger the, cover, the recovery, but balancing that against the need um, to have a credible plan in terms of ensuring that our public finances are on a on a um, sustainable footing. Um, we have very recently um, announced our spending plans for next year. Normally, we would have done a multi-year spending review in our in our terminology um, and set out spending plans for 
um, the next three years. We, we very deliberately only did that for um, for one year, announcing support for our public services, for our health system, and um, a, a program of investment in, in infrastructure, um, but leaving decisions on um, future sp spending to be to be set out when we have more certainty um, about um, uh, the, the crisis and the evolution of the economy, and that will be the the, the policy challenge for for the beginning of, of next year when when we set out um, the next stage of the recovery plan. Let me let me just um, just mention a couple of other issues in terms of kind of collective challenges we we face. Um, I mean, first of all, the, the kind of question of climate change, and um, I think the um, the, the growing sense and realization that as we emerge from this crisis, that the urgency of addressing climate change has, um, has, has increased, but also the opportunity in terms of as we set out recovery plans, um, uh, addressing, addressing that um, issue, whether, whether we're thinking in terms of investment programs, in terms of job creation, labor market, labor market schemes, um, a, a real opportunity for a, a step change in terms of our activities on climate change. And, and secondly, a comment about international cooperation. Um, uh, as we go into 2021, the UK will be chairing the G7, Italy will be chairing the G20, um, the UK and Italy will be working together on the COP26 um, uh, conference the, and the negotiations. And, um, you know, clearly, if you look across the Atlantic, potentially a, um, a, a new administration in, 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 in the US with a more, um, how can I say, a more international, uh, multilateral approach. Um, uh, so, a, a real opportunity for um, international cooperation, and I would argue a real need for international cooperation. And, you know, when, when we um, when we looked at the kind of details of what was happening to the UK economy um, earlier in the year, clearly a large part of that, large part of the impact on our economy was due to the restrictions we were imposing because of the virus, but also a large international element because of the downturn in the global economy, the impact on international international trade. If you, you know, those of you who um, know the London economy know that London is very dependent on international travel, tourism, um, uh, uh, and, you know, very, very, very globally connected. Um, so our individual economies will only recover um, if there is a global economic recovery and the importance of these international discussions, whether in the G7 or the G20, I think will be, be, be critical over the course of the over the course of the next um, the next year. Let me let me stop that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mark. That was very interesting. So um, let me have two uh, small questions. Right. The um, the first the first one is in what you said. Um, it was a bit different from from what I heard in in talking about the, the German or the European approach, in the sense that you say uncertainty is so important, so we really cannot make a longer term, let's say, financial commitments or longer term plans. Is that the right take, or did I take it correctly that way? So, for instance, uh, when we talk about the EU recovery program, we have this long-term vision in mind, doing strategic investments in digital or green or something. So there are expected to be really plan, planning processes triggered that otherwise wouldn't happen. But in what you said, that sounded more like we try to fix what is the current problem and see how things develop. But a longer-term strategic idea of transforming our industry or something is not a uh, part of the recovery program in that sense. Is that uh, correct? That, that, that's not 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 quite right. I think I think the point the point I'm making is the kind of need to um, uh, be very flexible and to kind of adjust as the circumstances change. So um, obviously we have we have set out our, our plans in terms of support for the economy. We have extended our support measures uh, well into next year, our furlough scheme, for example, until next March. We have set out our, our spending plans, um, uh, you know, which which um, cover the, the, the financial year um, starting next April. Um, the, 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 
the main point I am making is that, you know, uh, we are going to have to adapt those plans and further develop those plans as the recovery takes hold and as we understand the nature of that recovery and this, you know, this, this important decision that we are all going to have to face in terms of the rate at which we withdraw support from the economy, um, we can only answer that question in terms of um, how the virus develops and development on the, on, on, the, on the medical side. So, yes, we should be setting out long-term plans, but those plans are also going to have to be extremely flexible as, as the situation develops. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Mark. So I would like to hand over to Emmanuel. Um, so the question I, I, I sent to him was how to implement and coordinate in Europe. So in light of what Mark just said, I could, could add to it, well, how can you combine an efficient coordinate, uh, coordination and implementation with this, let's say, need for flexibility, which I think is really a, a very pragmatic argument, but probably very real. So the floor is yours, Emmanuel. Thank you, Jan Peter. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. And uh, I wanted to, to, to address your, your, your question by um, uh, addressing three, three issues. Um, first, the asymmetric impact of the, of the crisis we're living. Uh, the risk that it would uh, increase the imbalances in the Eurozone uh, and hence the need for a coordinated but differentiated response uh, by the euro area member states. Uh, so first, uh, uh, the, 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 the risk of the asymmetric impact of the crisis. Uh, the crisis we are experiencing is unprecedented as reflected uh, by the contraction of uh, GDP in the first half of the year and growth forecast for 2020 with uh, the the biggest recession since uh, World War II. And what we can see is that uh, significant uh, discrepancies among countries in terms of uh, growth impact and prospects are emerging and recovery could prove very different among member states, as you, as you mentioned in your uh, introduction. And I can see four, um, four big impact that could, uh, that could play. First, the different timings at which lockdown and social distancing measures were enforced or lifted at country level. This has played a, a, a role in the divergent economic outcome. We've seen countries that were hit first, uh, 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 some uh, hit less than others. Uh, 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 and, uh, and the second wave, which is a bit different between, uh, between countries. So that first, there is the, the, the impact of the sanitary, the health crisis. Second, there are differences in the economic structures uh, uh, in countries, including uh, exposures to services dependent on person-to-person uh, -person contact, uh, such as uh, restaurants, hotels, uh, hotel services, but, but in particular, tourism. Uh, where we have large discrepancies in the European, in the Euro area, uh, or in the or, or in Europe uh, more broadly, between you know uh, countries like like France, which uh, rely, uh, which uh, tourism represent 11% of GDP, uh, Portugal 15%, uh, Greece and Spain 17%, uh, and comparing to countries like. Uh, like Germany or the UK, where it's about 9%, I think. And, and it's nothing to say about the weather in, uh, in the UK or in Germany. Uh, third, uh, so, so this, will, um, uh, we, this will have an impact because, uh, because uh, countries rely differently on uh, external uh, demand and, in, and domestic demand. Uh, and th this will have an impact on the depths of the recession among uh, European countries. Third, uh, the size uh, and expected effectiveness of the policy response can vary from country to country. And finally, uh, uh, countries enter the crisis with very different macroeconomic situations, such as heterogeneous fiscal positions, uh, with some countries more indebted than others. And you can see uh, that in the forecast of the, of the Commission, we see clusters of countries uh, with countries where uh, around the limits of the stability and growth pact before the crisis, we are now heading around 80% of debt to GDP, 
and other countries going uh, uh, around 120 or even above, uh, uh, considering the case, for example, of, uh, of Italy. So there, there were different situations before the crisis, which can be uh, increased and heightened by the, by, the, by the crisis. The good thing is that the European response has mitigated some of the effects of the crisis early on, uh, protecting jobs, firms, uh, and in particular, sovereigns, uh, with the action of the ECB preventing uh, 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 any fragmentation uh, of the sovereign market. And it's, a, it's a big difference between the crisis we are living now and uh, the crisis we, we went through in 2008, 2009, uh, where we had to face also a deep fragmentation of the uh, European uh, bond, uh, bond, bond and sovereign bond market. Uh, uh, against this backdrop, um, uh, uh, this this crisis could lead to an increase in the in the divergence uh, in the in the in the euro in the euro area. Before the crisis, uh, the proper functioning of the European Monetary Union was hampered uh, by a lack of uh, aggregate demand and uh, and an unbalanced uh, policy mix, and this was uh, reflected. Uh, in the low growth and low uh, inflation uh, environment. Uh, and in particular, uh, 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 as underlined by the, by the Commission, uh, large um, uh, current account surpluses and uh, a deficit were highlighting the divergence between, between, between countries, but they were also showing uh, 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 some foregone growth and domestic uh, investment uh, opportunities with adverse consequences uh, for the rest of the euro area. Uh, uh, this time, you know, imbalance didn't play a, a, a direct role in the, in the crisis, unlike uh, in, uh, in 2000, uh, 2008, 2000, uh, 2012. Uh, but uh, uh, the combination of the asymmetric impact of the first wave uh, of, uh, of the health crisis and the sectoral specialization of the different member states uh, may aggravate uh, the pre-crisis uh, situation. Uncertainty is clearly high and it's too, still too early to, to, to determine whether or not the COVID crisis will lead to an amplification of the monetary union internal imbalances. But in any, any case, we should uh, carefully monitor the persistence of the macro imbalances and, and, and the market heterogeneity of the, of the members. So hence, again, with this situation, I think the important is to, is to um, have coordinated response and differentiated response. Uh, the key uh, priorities for Europe will be to combine the support uh, uh, for the activity in the, in the short term and to uh, reinvigorate uh, growth, but also uh, to enhance the growth potential uh, of the Euro uh, economy uh, in the medium and uh, long term through investment, innovation, competitiveness, uh, uh, and, and skills. And in addition to the EU uh, recovery plans, uh, national plans will uh, need to play a role uh, in the response to the crisis. And it is very important that we uh, use this crisis to invest uh, uh, in the future of the European economy, because as, as you said, at the, at the global level, we can see that uh, some, some, some regions uh, can be winners. Uh, we see that uh, China has been recovering very quickly, uh, and, and some other losers, and we don't want to be in the camp of the, of the losers. Um, so uh, considering the, 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 the interdependence of the, of the euro area uh, economy, um, uh, it will be essential to ensure uh, policy coordination uh, in order to have a rapid and sustainable recovery. Uh, and we, we, we think that the the, 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 the priority would be first to avoid any premature fiscal tightening uh, until the recovery is solidly entrenched. And we, we think we cannot repeat the, 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 the mistakes of the last crisis. When, when I remember uh, in, the, in, the, in the G20 in, uh, in Canada in 2010, uh, we decided to, uh, to, 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 to reduce our deficits and to reduce the, the, the our spendings and to uh, and to pull back our, our stimulus plan while it was while the, clearly the recovery was not was not really entrenched. We so we should also avoid any uh, non-cooperative strategies. 
which would uh, lead to, uh, uh, for instance, to a race to the bottom in terms of corporate taxation, in terms of wages, uh, which would lead to negative externalities uh, for uh, the euro area uh, as a whole. Um, uh, I think that the, the, the way we have devised the, 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 the recovery plans at the EU level will uh, help us uh, reduce uh, imbalances insofar as the plan should effectively address challenges identified in the country specific recommendation. Uh, for example, countries with uh, productivity lags and persistently uh, high indebtedness will need to pursue structural reforms uh, to boost their competitiveness and increase their potential growth. And in, and in, in, in parallel, countries with large external account surpluses uh, should foster wage growth, stimulate the de demand, and use uh, existing fiscal space uh, to boost to boost demand and uh, and public uh, uh, investment. Um, moreover, uh, uh, we should we should uh, we should underline that a recovery relying too much on uh, on export growth would be also subject to the heightened risk of a euro appreciation. Uh, or commercial tension in a context of increased uh, geopolitical risk. Uh, according to our estimates, a 10% increase in the euro would lead to a 0.8% decrease in the euro area GDP, uh, pri primarily, primarily through the impact, uh, 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 its impact on trade. And uh, growth should therefore primarily uh, supported, we think, by uh, internal demand and investment and innovation uh, uh, in the in the in the recovery plans uh, of the of the, of our country. Um, to conclude, uh, I think uh, I would like to underline, as 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 York said, that the EU recovery plan is unprecedented in many aspects, and uh, and and York has uh, rec recalled all these steps that have that have led to uh, uh, to, uh, to to this recovery plan at the at the European level taking into account the, 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 the intense work of the, of the Eurogroup and the Franco-German uh, cooperation. Uh, and such strong response was an unimaginable uh, a, a few months ago. Uh, so I think we should take into account that we've taken historic decision. Uh, this will create an unprecedented amount of common debt. So we are, we are uh, addressing the issue of uh, European uh, safe assets to this, uh, this response. Uh, and it, it, it's a very important step towards stronger economic integration in the EU uh, and larger solidarity among uh, member states. But clearly, in order for this to work and to function and to have an impact on, on growth, we need to carry on uh, the right uh, 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 policies. Uh, 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 and, uh, and, I, and I think it is important that we remain very much coordinated uh, in our response, uh, which affects uh, all our economy in a different uh, manner. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I think this uh, could have long lasting beneficial consequences on the solidity of the union as perceived by financial markets, multinationals and, and, and citizens more generally. Uh, 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 and those positive consequences should not be uh, underestimated uh, as uh, 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 the world is looking uh, at the at the response by the by the yeah thank you Emmanuel so that sounded like a, a great I would say plaidoyer for for this uh, for this uh, program and uh, I just take out one thing you said structural reforms should be undertaken somewhere. So I, my question to you and basically to everybody here is um, if you want to achieve something as a common body that takes a decision, like at the EU level, you say structural reforms needed in one country. Um, the question really arises, why didn't these structural reforms just happen by themselves? And what, in what way can you impose a structural reform on any country? Since we have here France and Germany and UK, maybe say Italy. <laughs> How do you do this? And uh, what do you? What type of forcing instrument do you foresee to implement any of the desired objectives that would make the program that you are talking about anything different from a just multinational, multinational uh, program? <laughs> 
right? So the, the idea that I took from Jörg and also from, from your statement was, this is not simply expanding our national programs with other money, which is commonly backed up, but it is really pushing our, through another agenda, which changes what the countries would do by themselves. First of all, is this a correct interpretation? And if so, what are your forcing instruments? So the, what, how do you make it happen? Maybe right. Emmanuel first, because it was really ready, really and then you have And let the other respond. But first, I don't think that you, you, we want to force anything on, every, uh, on anyone. I don't think that, you know, there, there is a need for ownership of reforms. And uh, it's only when you, when you own the reform that you succeed in implementing the reform. And that's what we've done you know, uh, in, uh, since the election of President Macron is to, is to consider that the reforms that we needed to do were really the, 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 the reforms of the labor market, the reform of the taxes, etc. They were reforms that we needed to do for France and it, they were not imposed uh, by, by, by the European Commission or by partner countries. We need to find the right incentive. And I think uh, in particular, the... The, the, the next generation EU and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the, the resilience and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and recovery plan are a good instrument. Why? Uh, because there is, a, there is an aspect of solidarity, clearly, uh, with uh, joint uh, emission or common emission, common, common, common financing. They are, uh, 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 we align uh, all national plans with uh, the EU objectives, in particular in greening and, and digital. We include milestones uh, in terms of reforms uh, in order to uh, uh, carry on disbursements. And we have a, a joint monitoring uh, of, uh, of the plans by EU member states to make sure that we all go in the right direction. And we base this on the, on the country specific recommendation that have, been, uh, that have been agreed upon us uh, on what we on what we should do. So I think it's more like it's. I, I guess it's more incentive uh, 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 than forcing. Uh, you know, uh, on on countries the need to the need to um, uh, the need to reform. Uh, you know, we will see how it works. Uh, but I think it it has created a momentum in each country uh, to devise a national plan that would fit uh, the, the the requirements. And the objective uh, of the of the EU and the challenges we need to face in terms of greening our economy and and digitalization of our economy. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Do you want to say something on this? Yeah, I would also say the it's all in the governance of the um, of the instruments that we're setting up, right? I think the the um, the mechanics um, are. Um, exactly as Emmanuel pointed out, out more one um, of incentivization rather than a forcing mechanism. Um, it's not hard conditionality. It is uh, it is uh, basically a common European approach where every member state presents their plans and objectives that have to adhere to commonly agreed standards. Um, and then there's a procedure um, that uh, goes through the member states and the commission um, where, of course, the Commission has the leading role in verifying that uh, that the programs contain a sufficient amount of reform elements. Um, and uh, the Commission, of course, has the mandate and the ability to reject plans if they don't adhere to the commonly agreed rules. And uh, the, um, the um, Economic and Finance Committee, um, of which uh, Manuel and I both have the honor and privilege of, of, of um, being members of, also have the, uh, has the task of verifying the, the um, the programs and every member state has the so-called emergency break um, to, um, to um, um, raise issues with uh, specific member states uh, when they think the rules that we've given to ourselves are not adhered to, um, escalate that to head of state and government level. So I think the governance go goes in the direction of, um, I would say, um, um, nudging and, uh, and, um, and pushing and uh, um, giving um, the power to um, to approve or not approve um, a to the commission b to the member states and then um, at the final round um, once uh, once a plan is uh, through the commission and EFC approvals process um, it goes back to member states again so um, if a qualified majority of member states then says that a 
another member state's plan doesn't um, fit to the commonly agreed, agreed balance of reforms and investments, um, then that member state doesn't receive the funds. That's the that's the governance that we have, right? So in, in that sense, you know, it's it's definitely not a you know hard conditionality ESM type program. That would be incorrect, but it's also not a um, um, do as you wish, uh, um, every member state does their own thing kind of program. So it's somewhere, I would say it's a, it's a healthy compromise in the middle. I think it would be great to have this even uh, announced more openly. I think this is a very important aspect also of the acceptance of the program in a, in a more general economic yeah. public, right? Because uh, there is always this feeling, well, this is just pouring money where, where it goes. <laughs> And that's it. And if you say, well, we have ideas and plans and there is some follow up, there's maybe even uh, some reporting or evaluation after a while and midterms or something like that, that yeah. would probably, I mean, everybody understands that full forcing is difficult in a, in a European project, but not forcing at all would also not work very well. Right? And yeah. so the compromise, I think, is what the best we can expect. Uh, but I think at the moment it's uh, it's quite natural because, of course, the um, that the public debate um, is, of course, um, you know, the, the 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 conflict and the debate around rule of law. And there's a very exciting to watch uh, and tension and uh, um, and um, and conflict. It's pretty obvious to me why the vast majority of the reporting that's being done in the public space is on the question of implementation of the whole thing. Once we have an agreement and once the once everything is implemented, I'm absolutely sure that uh, the debate will go more into the governance mechanisms and the exact implementation of the national uh, recovery programs. Don't forget they're being um, worked out as we speak. So it's very likely that the yeah. public interest in them is going to rise as they get more um, concrete and get developed and um, as the accompanying reforms also get specified. I mean, uh, I'll give you an example. In, in Germany, we have a um, national deficit, I think, um, in terms of startup companies and uh, growth of startup companies. We've just announced um, um, as the German government a um, very comprehensive program of um, tax incentives, both to employees of startup companies, hiring employees um, into startup companies, financing startup companies, um, both um, in, in, through our tax regime and through the uh, um, entities that we have um, to um, to co-finance uh, startup companies. So in that sense, we're we're also qualitatively addressing the uh, growth restrictions that we have in our country to make yeah. sure that we have a balance of reforms that are ambitious and um, explicit spending. Yeah. yeah. If I if I may put the question to Mark uh, in a, on, on a similar issue, this governance question is the, has that plays that any role in your considerations, or are you really uh, uh, using your argument about uncertainty, waiting for the time where it is the right moment to think about, let's say, more longer term uh, strategic investments, if, if, if any of those are uh, deemed necessary. What, what is your question on governance? Just to just clarify. Well, is, is this governance theme that uh, probably plays a, a role in the European context, anything that also matters for you in the UK, or is that since it's anyway only one country, there is no no such um, concern about uh, let's say misdirection of of monies in the uh, in, in this program. So I, 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 it's an interesting interesting question, but you know clearly um, um, the you know the issues that Emmanuel and Jorg are discussing around governance of the uh, EU and um, uh, the. Um, uh, arrangements and architecture of EU funds is is not something that is relevant in the in the in the in the UK. Um, uh, yeah, and but you know clearly um, uh, we have our as with any other country we have our domestic issues in terms of um, uh, you know management and proper governance of uh, public expenditure yeah. and gov government initiatives just like just like any 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 country faces. Um, and uh, you know, also um, uh, really important to address this question, question of structural reform. So if you if you look at the UK um, economy and the kind of challenges that we've faced since the financial crisis, one of the major issues we've faced has been disappointing productivity 
um, growth. So the you know structural reforms um, is is obviously a kind of key element of responding to that, and um, uh, will continue to be um, a a priority. Um, and I think it's you know it's interesting to reflect a bit in terms of the kind of political economy and the extent to which a crisis of this severity produces options for doing things differently and uh, addressing structural reforms that might not have been possible um, previously. Um, but no, it's an, it's an extremely, extremely important issue. Yeah. Okay. So I would, I would like to raise one question before we turn to the audience that has come up with some, with some question. And that is about more on the, on the funding side of these, of these programs. So they all have to be funded somehow. And, uh, um, uh, Emmanuel was already alluding to the fact we have the safe asset, the bond program that should fund it. And uh, the, the naive from my side is, is this program to last forever or is it a temporary endeavor? I mean, if you think about it deeply, you want a safe asset, you start to, to produce it. That's something that is, is there, has a peak in year zero, and then it, it's, it's, it goes down as repayment happens or do is this a is this a, a shift of policy towards finances in the in the European Union how 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 would you would you see that and maybe Emmanuel um, and I think in 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 the UK it's a bit of, of a different problem but uh, maybe you also have some some uh, opinion on the on the funding side so what what uh, whether that's simply through the budget or whether you have other other uh, ideas like in the European Union. So maybe Emmanuel. No, but to, to, to respond to your, to your question, it's, it, it's clear the understanding is that it's a temporary scheme. Uh, so, 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 so it is clear for everyone. Uh, it's a big step, uh, clearly, because we have not done that before, but it's a temporary scheme. Uh, but it's temporary, uh, but it's here to stay for, for, for long because uh, we will issue uh, bonds uh, to finance uh, the uh, next generation EU. Uh, the Commission will, uh, will uh, issue bonds. Uh, they will start to be uh, reimbursed in uh, 2028 uh, 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 with uh, you know, own resources, and we are, we'll be working on what could be the own resources. Uh, in particular, digital tax, uh, uh, carbon adjustment mechanism, uh, ETS, uh, uh, emission trading system, uh, uh, tax on plastics, uh, FTT, uh, uh, and 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 the bonds uh, you, and, and and the program will be, will be will be fully reimbursed if I'm if I'm not wrong around 2058. So you know we 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 I'm not sure we will be. Uh, we will be long retired before before be, be, before uh, the, the 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 bonds will retire, uh, and so uh, I think uh, we 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 are creating something uh, which is very important. But it's not it's not a regular financing mean uh, for uh, the EU at this stage. Thank you, um, Jörg. You want to add something to this? No, I think uh, Emmanuel um, explained it very uh, precisely. It's uh, it's it's a full it's an absolute agreement that this is a uh, um, temporary measure. It's one off, um, um, but it's very long term, right? So in that sense, um, um, as Emmanuel has pointed out, there is going to be a constant issuance of uh, European um, um, Commission issued paper um, because obviously it uh, it will roll from one maturity into the next. So that process will continue for many decades until the, the debt is retired that we're taking up for this. Um, and, and there's a very, and I think that's really the, the transformative um, element of this is uh, if we succeed to giving the European Union new own resources, um, and, you know, that, that uh, um, loan the process of debating which ones those are and uh, how they're implemented, um, that could really become a, a very fundamental and transformative discussion because uh, all of the um, examples named, um, especially things like digital or um, um, environmental taxes are things that, uh, as we see in the current debate, um, are very well placed at the European level. So in that sense, um, you know, these, uh, these instruments of, uh, of uh, um, own resources for the EU are also very fundamental questions of, um, of how 
we develop in terms of uh, future own resources. Yes, and if I may just add on this question, this own resources decision is not a temporary decision, or is it? Well, the ceiling will be increased to finance this specific instrument. So in that sense, it is, uh, it is also limited to the, uh, to the financing of the next generation EU. Okay, and then it, it would, would basically uh, uh, end uh, when, the, when the, the program is over, so to speak. That's the idea. Yeah, the, the, as you know, there's two elements to the, uh, to the increase of the, uh, of the own resources ceiling and the, 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 uh, the uh, specific 0.6% uh, uh, that pertains to next generation EU that, uh, that uh, expires. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mark, anything that you want to add on this uh, funding, on the, on, the, on the funding side? Is that a particular problem? So is it a, handled as a specific item in the UK? with a specific uh, funding prob uh, program, or is it just budget, basically? So I think your, I think your, I mean, your, your question was mainly for, um, for Jörg and Emmanuel, but, um, you know, we, we, are, we are all finance ministry um, officials, and it is our job to think not just about interventions in the economy, but also about the, the funding and um, the financing of those um, interventions. And, um, you know, we, we have all, um, I go back to what I said earlier, we've all faced an extraordinary situation um, massive scale government intervention in our uh, economies with, um, you know, very, very significant impacts on our on our public finances. And, um, uh, uh, you know, given the given the, the low interest environment that we face, um, uh, we have not faced any challenges at all in terms of kind of financing um, uh, and, and raising the necessary money. But I think. Um, as we look forward, this goes to the point of needing to have a comprehensive and credible economic plan, which is both about, um, uh, you know, continuing support to the economy for as long as is necessary, but also having a longer term plan for ensuring the sustainability of the public finances. And that, that is the job that we we all face in, in finance ministries across the world. But the, the challenge is, is even more acute in today's um, circumstances. Yeah, yeah. No, I find the in, the interesting point here is that we have these two things. One is to to basically cater for the current urgency of of uh, cash shortfalls uh, at the industry level, and then also to think about the longer term, let's say, strategic moves. And can you how, somehow combine that? So, if I may translate this into a question, if you if you look, and now I'm looking at one of the questions posed in the in the chat room. In the, in the Q and A section, um, uh, Frank Tchaikovsky is asking: After nine months of fiscal initiatives to manage the crisis, which instruments have worked really well and which are debatable? So, is there anything? If you look back, uh, like a, a bit like this question, if everything could be twice, so what, what would you reconsider and not do again from from what has been done in the in the first uh, almost year now? Uh, no, how? Nine months, nine months of the of the crisis. Does it come any anything to your mind that that has been not such a good experience? Well, I'll, I, maybe I can take the glass half full approach instead of the glass half empty approach. And uh, um, what I would say has worked very well, and uh, um, I can uh, I can answer that to Frank Tchaikovsky very directly because it pertains to his former employer, namely KFW. Um, you know the the KFW program of uh, guaranteed lending that we've uh, constructed is now uh, financing over a hundred thousand um, um, companies in Germany. So in that sense, we've received uh, um, literally um, um, you know thousands and thousands of uh, of applications for those loans. Ninety five thousand of those have been granted within a very short turnover time. Um, and that's exactly the kind of uh, impulse that we that we want to send. Um, so in that sense, um, you know, that's exactly providing liquidity to the companies that uh, that need the liquidity um, through the uh, through the uh, government guarantee programs that we have, and we we're seeing those still being uh, taken up quite well. Um, yeah. What the, the area that um, that has seen much less pick up or, or take up. Um, if you also want to hear sort of where the volumes are not as high as anticipated is certainly in our economic stabilization fund where we have the capability of also recapitalizing, i.e. providing equity finance to, uh, to companies. Um, and um, I um, can say that uh, we're seeing um, corporates being very, very careful 
on um, on uh, self-selecting into that instrument. On the one side, it's by construction because, of course, the EU framework has very high hurdles for companies to go into that program. But on the other side, I would also say that um, the fact that market financing has picked up quite um, quite quickly um, post-crisis and markets have returned to uh, normal functioning and also providing um, both equity and debt financing to companies and uh, banks through all of the um, instruments that we've chosen um, um, to help banks continue the provision of credit to the real economy um, have really helped, I think, to uh, to uh, use market instruments to uh, to get over this crisis. Um, so in that sense, um, you know, whenever uh, I'm being asked, um, is uh, is it a disappointment that the Economic Stabilization Fund doesn't have more um, companies asking for support, drawing support? I actually say, um, you know, you could also see that as a positive because the bulk of the companies actually. Um, is accessing markets, and that's the way it's supposed to be, namely um, state um, measures for recapitalization being really the, the ultimate last resource and last recourse and, uh, um, and, um, and everything else going to market. And we're seeing actually quite, uh, quite substantial volumes going through the private fin financing markets, both capital markets and banks. Which shows also that the system as it is, is resilient enough to deal with this, let's say, depth of the crisis, but at least this is true for what you see, what you say about Germany, right? So if I move to France or other countries, is, is that, would you say the same for, for, for your experiences in my way? Well, on, on our experience, we had, uh, our response was uh, built on, on four pillars. Uh, the first pillar is uh, guaranteed loans, like, uh, like the one ma mentioned by, uh, mm. by Jörg. Uh, we had an envelope of 300 billion uh, and we disbursed, uh, and the banks actually uh, disbursed 150 billion. Uh, so it's quite a big success in terms of, uh, of takeout. What we see in fact is that um, uh, it, it's, been, it's mainly take, it been taken by companies as a, as a lifeline, as an insurance policy, uh, rather than to uh, spend it because we've seen uh, in parallel, uh, an increase of about the same level in the in the cash uh, in, in, in the cash uh, position of uh, of companies. Uh, but this has been very very useful for uh, uh, small and medium uh, enterprise. Uh, large companies have uh, relied on their on on the markets mainly as the markets reopened quite quickly. Uh, after the after the March uh, uh, crisis, uh, but uh, but uh, but I think it's been a it's been a success. Then we had a solidarity fund, uh, which was a fund for subsidies to deal with uh, to deal with activities that were closed uh, or uh, which activity was uh, was considerably reduced, like hotel, tourism, restaurants, bars, discotheques. Uh, this we we there was. Uh, a take out of uh, something like six billion, and and we we have uh, reinitiated the, the 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 process in in the in the second lockdown. So we'll see uh, what's a take up, but I think it's a it's a it's something quite easy to 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 to, to send subsidies uh, 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 to, to to companies that need it. We had the partial work scheme here. We what we did is we we reformed our partial work scheme because. In, we, 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 there was very limited takeout in the last crisis of the partial work team. So we copied on our German friends, <coughs> actually, uh, on, uh, on the system you had uh, to make it much more generous and to have uh, almost 100% of the salaries taken, taken, uh, taken in, in charge uh, by, the, by, the, by the public for a short-term period. Um, this has worked very well. This has worked very well in the peak of the crisis in March, and it has uh, it has declined very quickly. Also, uh, we have set up a long-term activity scheme for uh, for activities like uh, aeronautics, uh, airlines, uh, we, we, which will be hit for a longer term, and uh, with uh, where where you can you you can reduce by sixty percent the working hours of uh, of, uh, of of your employees, but keeping them. Uh, in the firm, and for the for the time they are they are not uh, they are not working. They have training, and that's uh, I think uh, it, it, it took a little time to start because you need to negotiate with the trade unions uh, at each company level in order to implement it. But I think it's an interesting scheme for those 
for those activities will take uh, will take time to 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 recover. And the fourth pillar is um, is the postponement of uh, of uh, social contribution taxes where where we had a, a good taker. At the European level, I, I want to mention the the big success of Sure, the 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 refinancing system of uh, uh, unemployment uh, 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 coverage system, uh, national unemployment uh, coverage system. It was an idea that was dear to the heart of uh, Olaf uh, Scholz, uh, and uh, which worked very well. You know, we we should guarantees in order for uh, the Commission to issue bonds. Uh, the, 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 the demand for the bonds were, were very high, and the demand for the instrument is very high because uh, I think uh, on, on, under the control of, uh, of um, Jorg, I think we have a, a 100, 100 billion envelope for this instrument, and, uh, and the commitments are around 80 billion at the moment. So I think uh, it's, a, it's a big success uh, for, for an instrument that is used uh, by a number, by a number of, uh, of member states. I think the main challenge is rather than looking, you know, in the back mirror, is uh, how how we will deal um, with uh, going forward, um, and in particular, how uh, what is what will be our strategy uh, to um, to reduce the support uh, to 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 companies because some companies and some sectors will be will be hit uh, quite for a long time. Productivity will decrease because of uh, uh, social dis distancing measures, for example, if we reopen restaurants and you only can you can you can cater for only half of the clients, uh, the productivity will clearly uh, decrease and the profitability will decrease. So we we are we are looking at how how to um, to uh, reduce the, the amount of uh, of support, but uh, without uh, you know doing it too quickly and putting into uh, perils uh, some uh, so, some companies. I think also the other point we, we are looking at is how uh, we can uh, uh, use uh, also funding in order to restore the balance sheet of companies that are over indebted, uh, where we would need some capital ejection, and how we can we can we can devise an instrument that would uh, that would be compatible with the EU rules in terms of state aid. Mm. Yeah, so let me ask a, 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 a concluding question for to all three, which is that is also always this uh, the the spending programs we were talking about, but they they have they may have a, a cost in terms of prolonging the life of companies that better should go under and be transformed into something else. So this so-called zombification issue. How do you think you can deal with this um, this this problem in in your program that, that you are looking at, but be it the national or the European program, but I see it mostly as a problem of the nationals on the national programs. Maybe you actually want to start, and then and yeah, then Mark, and then Emmanuel. I think the, I think you have to you have to a um, make sure that you're not providing subsidies, but providing financing at as close to market terms as possible, and that's something that in the Economic Stabilization Fund. Uh, for example, we take great care um, um, to doing, i.e. for every single instrument that we issue in the, um, in the uh, economic stabilization fund, we approximate very carefully where the um, um, as close as possible market financing rate for that instrument would be. Um, um, so in that sense, we, we sort of substitute in um, a, um, a private sector financing. Um, and second of all, you have to engineer the exit into the entry, i.e. Um, you have to um, make sure that this doesn't remain a permanent instrument, uh, but that the incentives for management to, um, to seek private sector financing um, immediately um, is, um, is triggered as well. And, um, you know, in a very public case um, um, that we've funded, um, our very first case in the Economic Stabilization Fund, Lufthansa, um, as you can see from the public um, um, appearance on the market, um, they've been able to raise um, um, a billion euros of private sector financing since the Economic Stabilization Fund came in, both in terms of a um, hybrid convertible instrument um, and straight debt. So in that sense, you know, the, that, that I think is extremely important that uh, even in this very, very difficult situation, and um, you know, like every airline is struggling, um, the fact that, um, that it is possible um, to raise private debt 
um, and, um, and hybrid instruments in this environment is exactly the type of incentive that we want to set in our, um, in our measures, um, because that means that the sort of the, the, the forward path towards replacing the government money is already um, well underway. And the incentives you know, of increasing interest rates um, in our interest uh, um, over time are set such that um, you know, repayment happens as quickly as possible. And we're, we're happy to exit if we can exit soon. Okay, thank you. Mark, this problem should also be existing in the in the UK, right? With no, absolutely, and um, I mean, just in, you know, to go back to the previous question in terms of what we might have done better, you know, in very broad terms, I think we've had similar experiences, and we we um, you know all 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 took action very very quickly, and yes, in retrospect, we might have changed some of the parameters in terms of the design of our policies, but but I think in broad terms, um, our policy response was right and has been. Has been successful, um, but the challenge is looking forward in terms of um, uh, how to withdraw this support and, um, you know, to ensure, as I said earlier, to ensure that, um, uh, you know, while parts of the economy are being impacted by the virus or the government is imposing restrictions, there is a very, very clear and coherent case for, for support. Um, but how do we ensure that? Um, your, you know, your terms on verification that we are not supporting businesses that will not be viable in the in the future, and that that is that is the, the challenge. I very much agree with what what York said about you know to the, the extent to which we can provide support on on commercial commercial terms and uh, allow market mechanisms um, uh, to to work. Um, but it is it is this balance of as um, hopefully as the virus comes under control as we left, lift restrictions, how we withdraw support and how we um, uh, design uh, support in a, in, a, in a more targeted way to, to get back to some sense of, of normality. And I think, I think this is a very, very, you know, very significant challenge for all of us. And I'm sure there's masses that we will learn from each other in terms of our experiences over the coming months. Well, uh, Emmanuel, if you have your last word on this incentive, big incentive problem with zombification. You no, know, I, I agree with what was said. I, I, I just, I'm conscious of the time, so I just want to say two things. The first one is I think that we should not overemphasize this issue of uh, zombie companies because, as I said, when we look at, for example, the takeout uh, in, um, in guaranteed loans, we see uh, uh, in front of this uh, a, a big increase in terms of the cash that a company have uh, in their bank account. Uh, and we see a lot of cash actually in bank accounts uh, from the companies, but also from, the, from individuals. Um, uh, uh, that, and second, you know, the, 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 the question will rely very much on, uh, on, the, on the progress on the vaccines and uh, how we can uh, recover quickly. Uh, because as we've seen, you know, the fundamentals of our economy are quite good. Uh, as we've seen in Q3 with the rebound, we have had a very big rebound uh, in, uh, in, in Europe in Q3. And so if we have uh, a situation which improves markedly in terms of health situation, I think we can, we can recover quite quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel, Mark and Jörg for your um, interventions and for your participation in the panel. Uh, I think we shed some light on, on how the Recovery fund might look like. Um, there is, I think, for me, the main uh, uh, outcome is people have thought about it deeply, but the uncertainty that prevails will um, will also because there's a lot of time until the program will materialize will give us an opportunity to uh, to sharpen the knife, so to speak, or to work further on the program to make it uh, better suited for this for the problem at hand. But for the time being, these processes are in place, and I think um, we can look forward with optimism. I know everybody has to run. Time is over. Thank you very much for your participation, and thank you to the audience. Stay healthy, and we we'll see us next year.